So my name is Jennifer Whittem. I'm the new dean of the School of Engineering. I've been in the job a whopping three and a half weeks. Uh, thank you. And one of the distinct pleasures of the job is to attend events like this and introduce the amazing people we're gonna be hearing from. So first of all, I wanna thank the Stanford Alumni Association who is co-hosting this event together with the School of Engineering and the School of Humanities and Sciences. This is the first in a series, so you'll see more of these, and it's called Intersections. The goal is to bring together faculty from engineering and humanities and sciences to share insights on a common theme. Theme. And today that theme will be energy, something we're all certainly very interested in. In terms of who's out here today, we've got graduate and undergraduate alumni from both schools. Um, we're also webcasting live on Facebook, so we should have thousands of alumni and friends uh, also joining us from around the world. So this event was actually the outgrowth of a type of strategic planning process that the School of Engineering went through a couple of years ago that I was involved in. And we looked at you know, world's global challenges. And one of the things that became obvious in our planning process is that engineering doesn't solve these challenges on its own. What we really need to do is enable faculty across the university to be working together on these topics. Um, we identified specific topics that we thought clearly needed people from across the university to engage together to, to solve. For example, how do we provide humanity with the affordable energy it needs and stabilize the climate? That was one of 10 questions we came up, pressing questions. Another, how can engineering ensure that humanity flourishes in the cities of the future? Both of those are questions we're gonna hear some things about today. So, you know, one of Stanford's big strengths is that we are a liberal arts school. We have um, great faculty across the board. And so what we wanna do is work together and you know, have better solutions to these types of problems. So what we're gonna do today is hear an example of this type of thing where two very distinguished scholars from two very different parts of Stanford are gonna talk together about an issue that they're interested in and that of course is critical to all of us. So I'm gonna introduce the two speakers and then our moderator. The first one is Ian Morris. Uh, it's my first time meeting Ian. I hope I'll meet him again. He is the Jean and Rebecca Willard Professor of Classics. He's a fellow of the Stanford Archaeology Center. Um, he is a historian and an archaeologist. And one thing I've already learned is that when you're an archaeologist, part of your resume is where have you dug? So, <laughs> he has dug, <laughs> we don't talk about this so much in computer science where I came from. He has dug in Britain, Greece, Italy, and most recently perhaps Stanford's excavation at Monte Polizzo. Okay, sounds like a, actually sounds very interesting. He has been chair of the classics department, director of the Stanford Archaeology Center, and senior associate dean of humanities and sciences. He's had Guggenheim and Carnegie fellowships, two honorary doctorates, and I could probably go on and on. What I will just mention last is that he's written 14 books, and the most recent one has the provocative title, Foragers, Farmers, and Fossil Fuels, How Human Values Evolve. It was adapted from the Tanner Lectures in Human Values that he delivered at Princeton in 2012, and it traces the evolution of human values and how they relate to energy and resource extraction over the last 20,000 years. Okay, so that's a long time. And um, I hope we'll hear some of that uh, this evening. We have also... Professor John DeBerry. John DeBerry joined Stanford fairly recently. He's a professor of civil and environmental engineering as well as of mechanical engineering. He's the director of the Stanford Catalyst for Collaborative Solutions, which is another outgrowth growth of our planning process and it's quite an exciting new program that is bringing together expertise from multiple disciplines and perspectives, industry and the public sector to work on the type of challenges I described. And we're piloting the first projects shortly in that program. Um, Professor DeBerry's research focuses on science and technology at the intersection of fluid mechanics, energy and environment, and biology. He has also a number of honors, uh, a MacArthur Award, an Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, and a Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers, among many others. 
Popular Science named him one of its brilliant 10 for his research on bio-inspired propulsion. He's also worked on bio-inspired wind energy. For that, Bloomberg Business Week listed him among its technology innovators, and MIT Technology Review Magazine named him one of its 35 innovators under 35. And he was recently elected a fellow of the American Physical Society. So, welcome, Professor DeBerry. And last, our moderator is Amy Adams. Uh, she is an accomplished science and technology journalist. She's written for Science, Natural History, New Scientist, and many other publications. Uh, before coming to Stanford, she was Director of Communications at the California Institute of Regenerative, Regenerative Medicine. And she's now Stanford's Director of Science, and Commu of science Communications. So, welcome, all three of you. Uh, we're looking forward to an inspiring discussion. So are we on now? Yes? Okay. Um, so first I'll tell you the format for the evening. Um, I'm going to have a conversation with Ian and John um, for about an hour. Um, and at around 8, uh, we'll take questions from the audience. And we have a mic that will be going around to get your questions. Um, so I wanted to start by hearing from you guys about your work as it relates to the past, present, and future of energy. And Ian, I'd like to start with you. Um, your book focuses on how the way a society gets its energy, whether it's from foraging, farming, or fossil fuels, influences its values, um, particularly as they relate to violence and the acceptance of inequality. Um, and you wrote, and I love this, in a New York Times op-ed, um, based on your work, each age has gotten the inequality that it needs. And I want to know what you mean by that. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Do, uh, we, need, do we need inequality? <laughs> Well, I, I, I got interested in, in this topic because um, I'd been working about the long-term history of energy for quite a long time. And then I got invited, like I say, to give these lectures about human values. And um, I, I got interested in this, uh, this particular problem um, that uh, when we talk about human values, we mean something that is common to all humans. And biologists have done a pretty good job at showing that human values are an evolved adaptation. And, uh, there are certain sets of values that pretty much all humans have. You know, we all believe in fairness and justice and love. And you know, if you meet somebody who doesn't believe in fairness, you tend to think there's something wrong with this, but they're broken. You know, this is a cycle. Um, and the, the biologists have made a pretty good case that um, these are um, evolved adaptations, that the, the more the more that somebody coheres, to, conforms to these sorts of values, the more likely they are to find a mate and pass their genes on to the next generation. Um, a genetic predisposition to feel this way about things spreads to the population. So they're human values. But, say the anthropologists in particular, if you travel around the world, go to different places, people believe wildly different things about what is good and fair and just. So how can there be human values? So, so this is what I got interested in. And like I say, I was coming at it from the history of energy, which may be what made me come to the conclusion I did. But it seemed to me that when you looked at the, the long-term history of humanity, as far back as our records go over the whole planet, um, all this variety really just boiled down to three basic ways of thinking about values. And, um, the, and they were associated, I felt, with uh, the three groups you mentioned, foragers, farmers, and people who use fossil fuels. And what I mean by this is foragers, hunter-gatherers, people who live off wild plants and animals. On the whole, they tend to say, people are all the same. And so fairness and justice means treating people the same. And the more you do that, the more just you are. People in farming societies so, tend to say people are all different. People, that, people who are you know, living mainly off domesticated plants and animals, so providing their energy. They'll say people are all different. Um, you know, the pharaoh is a god. And so it would be wrong to treat the pharaoh the same way I treat John. Because John is just a professor. And so he should not treat a god and a professor the same way. That would be unfair and unjust. Um, and men and women are different. You must treat them differently. Free and slave are different. You must treat them differently, and so on. But then in the fossil fuel world that we live in, we swung back to saying kind of, people are pretty much all the same. And you should treat them pretty much all the same. Um, not completely the same, but pretty much all the same. That is fairness and justice. 
So it seemed to me this is a, a pretty good description of the big picture. But then the question, of course, is oh, why? Why does it work this way? I, is it that if you leave this auditorium and you go home and eat a big bowl of wild rice, do you suddenly start to feel egalitarian? Well, if you have processed cheese, you become hierarchical. And, uh, well, obviously, you can try this for yourself. Um, but I suspect the answer is no. And uh, the, the, the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me, or it's a, I, mean, you know, I sort of you know, given away the, the game with the names I gave to these groups, the foragers, the farmers, the fossil fuels. Um, each, each of these groups is shaped by a different way of obtaining energy from the world. And this has a series of consequences. Um, your energy revolutions are, are not just about climate change. They're about a lot of other stuff as well. I think this is one of the big things that this work drove home for me. Um, foragers, the people who live off wild plants and animals. Foragers capture very small amounts of energy. And it varies according to where you live and so on. Uh, but typically, a foraging society, you're getting something like five to 10,000 kilocalories of energy per person per day. Now, on that kind of energy budget, you are forced to live in very small groups that move around all the time as different plants ripen, different animals migrate. Um, it's almost impossible to maintain significant levels of hierarchy um, within the society. And overwhelmingly, people tend to conclude, well, you know, we, we have to treat everybody much the same in order to make this way of life work. And that surely that is a just way to run the world. That is how the world should be. They tend to be very, very equal societies. Uh, and um, there's a, a way economists like to use to measure inequality. They call it the Gini coefficient. And I'm sure some of you will have come across this. But basically, it's a scale that runs from zero to one, with zero being perfectly equal and one being perfectly unequal. So if you are using it as economists often do, say, to measure income inequality, if, if all of us in this room had a Gini coefficient of zero, that would mean we took all of our income, put it in a big pile, then divided it up exactly equally among all of us. And, and to get a, a coefficient of one, we take all the income, put it in a big pile, I take everything and go home. <laughs> and uh, you, you can't actually have a coefficient of one because, of course, you all die if I take everything. So, but yeah, the closer you get to one, the more unequal society is. And typically, uh, hunter-gatherer societies score about 0.25 on the Gini scale, and they overwhelmingly tend, tend to say, that's, that's what it should be. That is right and just. Well, if you look at farming, pre-modern farming societies, basically everything is different. They tend to consume 10 to 30,000 kilocalories of energy per person per day. They tend to be very sedentary, not very mobile, much bigger groups, uh, can have cities of up to a million people, become very, very hierarchical. Um, Gini coefficients tend for income tend to score about 0.45, so much higher than the 0.25 in the foraging societies. And again, they tend to say, this is as it should be. Our rulers are gods or children of gods or whatever. This is how the world should be. Inequality is right and fair and proper. And you might fetch about where you are personally in the pecking order and about how stupid your leaders are, but not about the fact that there are leaders and that there are inequalities. Then, fast forwarding again to the fossil fuel world, um, massive amounts of energy we now consume, 30 to 230,000 kilocalories per person per day with, of course, United States gloriously heading the league there. Um, massive amounts of energy, huge, highly mobile society, cities of up to 35 million people, um, Rather complicated balance of equality and inequality. The modern world has democracy, has gender, in, gender equality that would have shocked anybody in any earlier age, really. And yet we still have Bill Gates. Um, yeah, we, we, we will tolerate certain kinds of enormous inequality, but not others. And um, in the, the, more, the richer countries, the OECD countries, the average Gini score for income is about 0 0.30, so closer to the um, foragers than to the farmers. So it's weird and, and complicated um, sort of history here. But again, yeah, we, tend, we tend to find that the more you uh, end up around that sort of level of inequality, the more successful your society is, and the more we tend to think this is right and proper. So, um, long answer, but that's kind of why I say each age gets the, the inequality it needs. They tend to, um, you know, like, like any other kind of evolutionary competition, the closer you conform to the optimal equilibrium path, the better you're likely to do. And the same kind of applies to violence too. And this is where I found that my work sometimes just really, really upsets people and nobody wants to talk to me anymore. <laughs> but. Um, 
Well, just as, uh, in a foraging society, you can only have certain very low levels of inequality. You can, however, tolerate very high levels of violence. And um, largely, you sort of need to, because you have almost no institutional means to contain violence. It's up to people to work things out for themselves. And so it's not uncommon for foraging societies to have rates of violent death 10, even 20%. That is, you know, you've got a 10 or 20% chance of dying violently when you're born in one of these societies, which is horrifying. Farming societies cannot function with that level of violence. Their governments, one of the big things governments do is suppress violence within the society. Farming societies mostly seem to fall in the 2 to 5% range of rates of violent death. Fossil fuel societies can tolerate even less violence. We, we run with this enormously complicated division of labor. If we all run around, I give, you know, Amy and I disagree in the questions, and I pick up my mug and club it. Actually, she would probably club me to death. But anyway, one of us clubs the other to death. You know, this is not going to work. And we cannot have uh, this series of talks if people are going to behave that way. Um, in the 20th century, um, you know, we tend to think of the 20th century as the bloodiest in history, which in a, a purely numerical way it was, but it was also the safest in history in terms of rates of violent death. The global rate of violent death was just a little over 1%. Now it's 0.7%. In countries like Denmark, it's way, way, way under 0.1%. Again, we live in what would have seemed like a magical kingdom to almost everyone in history. Um, and obviously there are places like Syria and Somalia and Sudan which break this pattern, but overwhelmingly we live in the safest age the world has ever seen. So like each age gets the kind of inequality and the kind of violence that it needs. And the needing is shaped very largely by the amount of energy we extract from the world. And I think the big question all this really led me to is, of course, well, so what? What is going to happen next? Uh, I think we are living through a, a revolution in energy capture, but fortunately, I don't have to tell you what that means because we've got John here. We've got John. <laughs> Which brings me to John, who, uh, developed, among other things, has developed a number of wind turbines. Um, and I want to come back. He also studies jellyfish, so we want to come back to that. Try to explain so, how yeah, that comes together. And how that comes is an intersection. Right. Um, but could you tell us about the wind turbines you've been developing? And uh, absolutely. Like? And it, it very much plays into what we just heard of the idea of foragers versus farmers, thinking about different ways of getting our energy. So uh, my, myself and my, my students, we've had a lot of fun over the past decade developing new ways to capture wind energy that are different from the wind turbines you're used to seeing out uh, in Livermore or in the pasture. I think one of the things that we recognize, and many of you in the audience do as well, is that wind energy and solar energy as well should have an inherent advantage uh, due to its global distribution. So if I think about coal, for example, it sits under about 5% uh, of the Earth's land area. And so a few lucky countries like the United States happen to have those resources nearby. Others don't. In the case of wind and solar, it's, it's a more uh, broadly distributed resource. And so you would think that would be uh, an opportunity then for us to be able to disseminate these technologies globally and more rapidly than we see right now. What's unfortunate and ironic is that we've taken the model for generating energy that was uh, developed in the fossil fuel age, this idea of centralized generation, where because the mine is located at this location, I build my plant to process whatever I've uh, pulled out of the ground there, and then I cable that power over long distances, that's the model we've tried to force on some of our renewable energy systems as well. And so wind farms, as you, you're all familiar with, we try to cram a bunch of turbines into a small space and then pipe that energy over very long distances. And so what we've been working on for the past decade is trying to find ways to better take advantage of that, uh, that distribution of the wind and to develop technologies that would allow us to generate wind energy closer to the end user. Now, there's inherent scientific challenges in doing that. So for example, the wind in the plains of Iowa or Texas are very smooth and even, and so it's very easy to predict what that wind resource looks like. If I was to ask you what the wind is in downtown San Francisco, you'd have a much harder time answering because as the wind passes through the buildings, there's turbulence generated, the direction of the wind shifts constantly, and so we haven't really had good technologies to to be able to capture that wind. And so one of the things we've been doing, referring to jellyfish, is studying biological analogs that have actually solved
solve this problem for us. And so, for example, you're all familiar with fish schooling in the ocean or, or flocks of geese. And the way that they're able to navigate through these complex environments is by arranging themselves in very particular patterns. And what we've done over the past few years then is to study how this occurs in nature and to develop technologies that we've now deployed in the real world that are able to put the turbines in places where they simply couldn't be before. Now, as someone who's interested in science and engineering, we pushed forward without really thinking about the consequences of one type of generation versus another. You know, typically you're asking, can we do it, not should we do it? And one of the things that comes up now is now that you have this opportunity for a more distributed energy source, what are the implications going to be societally? When the ownership of the energy is not PG&E, but you in your backyard, that could make different societal choices for you. Uh, in a developing country where they're not wedded to the very old and large grid that we have in the United States, they might go directly to these new technologies. And so does their society develop in a different way than ours has? These are a lot of interesting questions that I don't have the answer to. I, I I was promised you'd give us an answer today. Uh, but what I'd like to see is us on the science and technology side develop some of these solutions with those ideas in mind. And that's why I'm really excited uh, for, uh, many of you don't know, I'm a newcomer to Stanford. I came up here just about a year and a half ago uh, from Caltech. And I think Stanford has a unique opportunity to address these topics because you have folks like Ian. You know, all your, your work focuses on you know, wind energy and sol you know, solving these glorious problems and green energy and helping people. Had it ever occurred to you before basically tonight, <laughs> um, when, maybe last week when you first started reading about Ian, that, that these kinds of technologies could also influence things beyond just sort of the environment or bringing people power. It could influence rates of violence in communities. Not at all. <laughs> I would have been maybe more cautious in how we proceeded in our research thinking about it. Now, I will say we, we do spend a lot of time thinking about uh, human nature in the adoption of the technology. So we've, for example, developed smaller wind turbines that could power villages. We have a project in Alaska where a small fishing village normally has diesel fuel flown in uh, uh, occasionally at very high cost. And despite that high cost, despite the fact that they know the diesel is polluting, they know it works. And so when I come in with my fancy gizmo and say, hey, use this instead of the diesel fuel, there's skepticism there. And so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done at that scale, uh, adopting technology. But then we can think about renewable energy uh, writ large and trying to get people to appreciate the, the, the dangers of climate change. And there as well, I think we need to do a better job of thinking about human nature, human response, what motivates people to make change. I think to your question, we often as engineers come into the problem thinking if we come up with a cool enough gadget, people will will flock to it. And that might be true for the iPhone, but uh, that's probably the only technology that seems to have that kind of success. And so until we come up with the iPhone equivalent for climate change, for solar energy, for wind energy, it's going to be an uphill battle in, in massive adoption of these technologies. You know, we're sitting here tonight talking a lot about wind, because we have you on the stage. Um, but I mean, it has to be acknowledged, we, we don't know what the future of energy is right now. And we're kind of in an uncertain age. Um, on the one hand, we have President Trump, who recently signed an executive order rolling back environmental protections, you know, theoretically helping the coal industry look more appealing. Um, so fossil fuels are clearly still on the table. Um, and then I thought it was interesting, after he, after he did that, the CEO of GE, Jeff Immelt, um, came out and said, well, if the government's not going to lead, companies have to lead. So now, you know, we have this other model where, you know, forget the government, companies are going to go ahead. And what he wrote was, companies must have their own foreign policy and create technology and solutions that address local needs for our customers and society. So businesses should do it on their own. So you have, um, you know, some people marching off going green and you have government, you know, trying to um, bring coal back. We have nuclear, which we haven't talked about at all. So clearly we're at an uncertain time. And, you know, in your book, you really talk about a lot of disruption and violence um, yes. that comes along yes. with these transitions. And I'm thinking, you know, we're at such a fractured, uncertain time. Does that make the, the violence and disruption scarier and worse, or do we know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course, um, I don't actually know anything about anything. I mean, just, just about what's That's already happened. That's a mixed stuff up. Um, but I think, 
in a way, of course, this is how all of us work. Is you know, we, we look at the past and try to identify patterns and base our judgment about what to do next on those patterns. And also about our sense of what, <coughs> what, what is likely to happen which might change the patterns and lead us off in a radically new direction. And I think the, the, um, the, the two big energy transformations earlier in history can, I mean, they don't, they don't give you the answers to anything, but they can be very suggestive of the sort of range of outcomes we should be looking at. And so like, I'm thinking about the transition from um, you know, a foraging world to a farm farming world and then from a farming world to a fossil fuel world. And the, the earlier transition uh, you know, is a very, very distant one in time, so there's a lot of stuff about it we don't know all that much uh, about what was going on. But with the shift from farming to fossil fuel regimes, I think what we see is very interesting. Um, the sort of anarchy you were just describing, all these people with different ideas and they're all duking it out and they're all yelling at each other. And that, this seems to be absolutely par for the course. I mean, 200 years ago, when, um, f uh, 250 years ago, when fossil fuels are first really coming online in a big way in Northwest Europe, in Britain in particular, Nobody knew what this meant. Um, some people thought it was about to change everything and they were right. Others said, yeah, it's just some new gizmo, it doesn't really matter. Some people were very keen to be protectionists and protect existing industries against the threat of new coal-powered steam engines that have been brought into all these new industries. Other people are saying, yeah, bring it on. And we're desperately trying to think up new ways to use, uh, use these new technologies. And the results, um, well, you know, one thing they didn't foresee, of course, was the impact fossil fuels are going have on climate change and, and you know, just like we, we don't foresee a lot of the consequences of the new energy revolution because you cannot foresee this stuff until it starts to happen so they didn't know that was going to happen they did though see that um, bringing online fossil fuels was going to transform the distribution of wealth and power both within and between society so have like a sociological and a geopolitical impact and the sociological impact was massive. Um, it meant that people who were early adopters within British society initially open up the factories, become rich on a scale nobody's imagined before. And uh, have a dominance and a power in the country again nobody's previously imagined. The balance of power within the country shifts dramatically. But then the global balance of power shifts out of all recognition as well. And, um, Northwest Europe was already very powerful, but suddenly in the 19th century, Britain becomes the first country in the history of the world that can and project power globally. And if a country like, say, China in the 1840s says, we don't want to allow all these cheap British manufacturers into our country because they think we think they will undermine the traditional way we've done things, the way we like to do things, the British just send steam-powered gunboats, sink the entire Chinese fleet, shut down the Grand Canal, and start starving the capital city into submission. And the Chinese say, on second thoughts, maybe some cheap manufacturers in Manchester would actually be quite nice. Um, huge shift in global wealth and power. Um, European countries come to dominate the world. Um, Britain rules one third of the surface of the planet by the end of the 19th century. Millions of people are killed in the colonial wars. Now, if the, the way the lessons of history work is simply that we see something rather similar rerun in the 21st century. Um, if we get a comparably enormous shift in uh, energy systems, we have got a problem because the British did not have nuclear weapons and now we do. And the good news is that we no longer have enough nuclear weapons to kill everybody. This is great news. For every 20 warheads in the world in uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, for every 20 warheads in the world in 1986, the peak year, there's now one. There's no longer enough nuclear weapons to kill everybody at one go. But we can build them again really, really quickly. So, um, w one of the things I think we have to learn is that we must master the sort of use of violence we've always seen in the past in order to um, manage these shifts in wealth and power. If we don't, then the game is over. What That's about cheerful. speed? There. Thank you for that. <laughs> Fears out in the hallway. Um, what about speed? Speed, so, yeah. Speed is a big, big deal. Yeah, because yeah. in the past, um, it also took longer to get the warships to China yeah. and technology spread more slowly, whereas today, um, you know, technology can be spread in an, in an instant. So. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. Speed is a, speed is a, a big thing that's changed. And you know, going back even further to the, the foraging farming transition, um, when a group takes up farming, it's able to support a much much bigger population than a foraging group, and much more complex societies, more advanced technology, more violent ways of, of waging war. And the result of that is the farmers take over the world, uh, and they drive foragers out into the bits of the world farmers don't want. You get foragers in the Kalahari Desert. You get them 
them at the North Pole, you don't really get them anywhere else. They've been driven out completely. But because um, the process moved so slowly, it was possible for farming to be independently invented in seven or eight different places around the world. And each became the, the, the core of a great civilization, China, India, the Middle East, Northwest Europe, Mexico, Peru, other places too. It was happening in this really, really slow motion way. Um, when the Industrial Revolution starts, I mean, it, in a way, it's actually still unfolding now, 200 years later, but the initial phase in the 19th century saw the Europeans have invented this stuff. Nobody else has time to have an indigenous Industrial Revolution. Europeans take over everything. Now it's going to happen a lot faster than that. I mean, this is desperately scary when you start thinking about it. And the other side of the coin, which makes it, I think, frankly, even scarier, is um, when you think about the transition from foraging to farming, it's like there are tens of thousands of separate natural experiments going on around the world. As each different foraging band tinkers around, becomes farmers, doesn't become farmers, most fail at the experiments, some succeed. With um, fossil fuels, at that transition, um, there were like two or three places in the world where it's plausible to think there might have been an industrial revolution. The, the first one really to hit the barrier gets it right in Northwest Europe and then they take off. Now we've really got one global experiment going on. And if we mess this one up and um, start using nuclear weapons on each other, we don't get a second chance. It's over at that point. So, uh, yeah, I, mean, usually, I should say, usually I come to these things, and I'm the big optimist. I think everything's going to be great. Uh, tonight we seem to have gone down a yeah. very dark path, but there is stuff to worry about. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come back to what parts could be great. Let's go, let's go to John. Um, you know, we talked about speed. So what is the speed? Where, well, where it are certainly we? where are we going? depends on field. If you compare wind versus solar, solar is growing much faster. And I think it has to do with some of the comments I made earlier about the ability to install renewable energy in every corner of the globe. And it goes to prediction, knowing where the resource is. So there's great tools right now where you could look up online what the solar resource is above this building. You can't do that for wind yet. And some of that's just basic science. The wind resource near this building depends on what time of year it is the direction of the wind, whether you're on the lee side of the building or not. Uh, solar, it's simpler to do, frankly. The other is that you have the technology itself, the panels that can be installed, rooftop solar, other sort of distributed modes that allows you, as you know, some of our colleagues are doing in developing world, to install in places where five years ago there was nothing. Now there's actually quite a bit of solar energy penetration. So I'm more optimistic the, uh, about the trajectory of solar. Maybe it's being closer to the wind industry. Uh, you mentioned earlier the idea of companies taking the lead, but the reality is companies are still are, are quite conservative these days in new technology. So GE will certainly make an incremental improvement on their existing wind turbine, but if you look at their 2017 model and their 1985 model, uh, with, with all due respect, there's not a lot of difference between the two of them, uh, fundamentally. It's three blades, it spins uh, pointing in the same direction, and <laughs> so my, my, my conviction is that we're going to need other stimulants of research, uh, of innovation, besides the, the, the conventional ones that you would see in industry. In our personal case, I can point to nonprofits. For example, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has been very instrumental in supporting research in that risk gap where it's a concept and you know, I'm going there saying, hey, we want to uh, develop wind farms inspired by fish, right? You know, he's probably smart to not write a check on that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the good alumni of Stanford will and support research in that area. And, it, and at the end of the day, it, it makes a difference because it allows us then to make some of the leaps that Ian's talking about. So in certain areas, I'm, I'm more or less optimistic, really depending on whether we're talking about uh, wind or solar. Maybe we'll come to nuclear as a, a third rail later. Yeah, well, let's go. Um, I mean, we, we haven't talked about nuclear at all, but clearly there, there are a number of people, in, including Stanford's own Steve Chu, who really feel that nuclear has to be part of the equation. So how, where does that fit in? Well, I, I would say personally, nuclear is the logical, rational option. But we also know that if we wanted to reduce health care costs, eating healthy and exercising is the logical, rational thing to do. And we don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we should continue to work on technology, but I, I really think it's going to be better understanding, again, how do we uh, understand people's motivation? How do we motivate people to think about going to a technology like that? The, there's issues of weaponization, and certainly those can be addressed, storage. These, these are not insurmountable technical 
uh, issues in my opinion and I think you get so, you solve a lot of the problems that we see in wind and solar intermittency uh, meaning not knowing tomorrow whether the wind is going to be strong enough at our wind site or not uh, without having to, to go to storage so on paper I would say that would be the way to go practically speaking I don't think we're going to see it in my lifetime and so I'd rather personally spend my efforts on technologies that I think have a, a brighter future do, do you think, you know, you and, and your world, it, do you, can, <laughs> your whole world, My can, world. Um, can, can people be influenced? Like, can, can you march up to some, some leader and say, here's my historic research, and don't you think you want to make better decisions? Or, um, <laughs> you, you wrote that nice op-ed yeah. in the New York Times. Like, do, do people listen? I'll, I'll get right on this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I find... Uh, I, I, yeah, it's been very pleasant to find out how many people are interested in this. Um, less so to find out how few people are actually listening um, to, to what's been said. Or, or perhaps it just means that they do actually know better than I do uh, about these things. And uh, I found that it, since I, I began my academic career in a fairly conventional historical archaeological field where you look at you know, one place, one block of time, in fairly small scale, and try to know everything you can about it. And then in the last 10 years or so, I've gone to this you know, big global scale, millions of years perspective. And I, I found, well, I do that largely because I, I like it. It's fun. But I find it's also changed very much the way I think about history writ large and humanity. And I think that the bigger the scale you look at, the more history starts to look like a subfield of biology. That the rules governing history look very, very similar to the rules governing biological evolution, except it's operating on a cultural plane. I mean, you know, we humans, like all the other animals, because we evolved biologically, um, and in that way we're exactly like all the other animals. But the difference is that our biological evolution gave us these amazing brains that no other animal has, and that made us capable of cultural evolution. We can change the ways we do things. I mean, if you're a primatologist and you're studying chimpanzees, they basically do the same damn thing whether you're in West Africa or East Africa and um, that chimpanzees do what chimpanzees do and our ancestors were exactly the same up till about a hundred thousand years ago when we come on the scene we got the brains that allow us to change the ways we behave um, as we see different payoffs from different forms of action and um, I come to suspect that what this tells us is that changing our behavior is a process driven by the same forces that drive biological evolution, something a little bit like natural selection. Um, we respond positively to things that uh, allow us to do what we want to do in an easier way without taking too many risks. And um, so if you have electric cars that cost less and run on less than uh, internal combustion engines, people will buy them. If you don't, they won't. And you can influence that, of course, through government policy, by, by subsidies and tax breaks and so on. But basically, what, what's going to drive our behavior is what we feel works best for us. And in the past, humans have never been very good at foreseeing um, long-term, large-scale processes, because that's not what we evolved to do. And we evolved to deal with what's happening right here and now. And so I tend to feel that unless um, John is able to solve all our problems <laughs> by driving the cost of wind power down low enough that we can do all the things we want to do and then more um, at a lower cost, then no, it's not going to happen. So John, get on it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I I'm still looking for a con like I want a concrete answer out of this though. We, um, oh, well, I mean, so I, like, I, I is there something you can? So. <laughs> well, is there Lots. something you could say like if there were a, a world leader in front of you and you were to say, look, like we're we're kind of heading towards the brink here. We, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we're in a transition. Transitions have not gone well. Let's work together to think about how to make this transition go smoothly. What would a smooth energy transition look like? What would it What would it take? Would Would mm -hmm. all the leaders of the world have to get together and agree on what's next, or what could be done? Well, um, I mean, nothing quite like that has ever happened before, which makes it seem slightly unlikely. Um, and in the past, uh, it seems to me almost everything has worked through the sort of messy situation you were describing earlier on. People, I mean, again, very like biological evolution, where you get random mutations, some of which are adaptatively successful, others aren't. People have ideas, some of which turn out to be great. And they go, they, they run with these ideas, and everything begins to change. Most ideas turn out to be really stupid, or actually most turn out to just be rather pointless. A few turn out to be really stupid, most rather pointless. 
Um, the problem with that way of doing things is that that worked really, really well during the 100,000 years or so we, uh, we were evolving into modern forms um, out as hunter-gatherers in Africa. Works a bit less well when we've got nuclear weapons and we're poisoning the chemistry of the atmosphere. And it certainly works, um, it, it tends to produce very bumpy outcomes with a lot of disagreement, um, people feeling very strongly about things and um, sometimes being willing to resort to violence to get what they want for the world. And uh, that is, um, I think that, that's the scary scenario that it's going to spiral out of control. We're going to see massive um, imbalances, new imbalances in wealth and power developing. If, say, the current administration succeeds in dramatically setting back research into renewable energy in the US, we're almost certainly just going to see the center of innovation moving somewhere else. Um, we, we're already living through one of the biggest shifts in wealth and power in the history of the world from um, the US toward China. That's going to accelerate. Um, and. Uh, Again, it, it might all go really smoothly, but all the lessons of the past are that it won't. How you get it to, uh, how you get us to have a smooth transition to an entirely new energy regime? Well, you, you may as well ask me how I, how we actually build the wind turbines. I mean, if I knew that, <laughs> I would be a really, really famous diplomat. Um, except that again, I, I don't think it really works that way. It doesn't work by one person having the answer and selling it to other people. It works through this kind of competitive, messy business. Um, we have to learn to manage that better. But the good news is, again, you look at the long term, the, the greatest thing humanity has ever done is this process I was talking about of lowering the rate of violent death. We have learned to manage violence. And we've driven our rates of violent death down from the 10 to 20 percent range to the well under 1 percent range. No other species of animals ever has done that. This is something to be very, very proud of unless you live in Syria. Um, we have to do more of this if we don't we have a real problem. So I want to hear a little more about um, how do we get, how, how do we get to um better clean energy. Well, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would say that the transition is not uh, a single thing, a monolithic uh, idea. It's going to look different in Palo Alto than it looks in Mumbai. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we even plan our, our technologies. It's not a one-size-fits-all wind energy solution or solar energy solution or nuclear energy solution, as it were. One of the things I think we as engineers can benefit from, though, is thinking about the consequences of plugging in a particular technology in a particular context. Um, often, as I say right now, I think our goal is to build a suite of tools and to characterize them to understand when they work and where they would work. Uh, but I think there's a, a great opportunity to work with people, whether it's in policy, business, uh, in the humanities, to think about the actual deployment of those technologies in different spaces. I'm particularly optimistic about the developing world because they don't have the, the hamstrings that we do in terms of uh, a, a grid legacy. So thinking about your, your evolution example, we have this vestige of a centralized generation model that is going to force our wind farms to be these very large uh, endeavors here in the United States. If you go to Malawi, you know, East Africa, or uh, you know, a rural village in India, they don't have that as a constraint on the way that they're going to generate their energy. And I see that as an opportunity. Now, we still need to do a lot of basic research to develop t the technologies that work there because GE spends all their time thinking about the large wind turbine that's going to work in Texas or Oklahoma, not a smaller system that's going to work in that village. And really, there's not a lot of incentive right now for someone to think about those other contexts because it's hard to make money in those spaces. And so the question is going to be, in that case, you know, we were talking earlier about cost. How do we make this cost effective? It's, it's hard to be drilling a hole in the ground and burning what comes out. And so trying to find a modality where a wind turbine with 8,000 components is going to be less expensive than that is, it's a tough ask. What about um, in, in developing countries where maybe they don't already have access to things that they can burn out of the ground? Um, what, what is the cost comparison there? Like is getting a solar panel if you're somewhere that's never had electricity is, is that cost effective? I, I don't know the... Well, I think the, the value proposition is not just in the energy. So there's an important nexus between water, energy, food, and solving one of those will have ripple effects on the others. I, I can take our Alaska project as an example. If you go there in the middle of winter, as one of my brave grad students uh, did this past <laughs> year, he would tell you he didn't need electricity, he needed heat and light. 
And so, for example, one of the things we're working on is using the energy of the wind, and rather than worrying about generating electricity, directly converting the kinetic energy of the wind into heat or into light sources. And that turns out to be a very different calculation for the grid that you're going to support in that case, because obviously it's going to be a very localized system because you don't have a way to pipe that heat or light to another location. Uh, but it also provides uh, an incentive for the people who are in that village to, to have some ownership over the structure. And I think you know, going to the idea of inequality, one of the challenges that, that I see is that lack of, uh, that feeling that you don't have control over your own destiny, your own fate. Uh, when you are the person who's in charge of your own energy, there's some responsibility that comes with it and there's challenges in how you manage that. But I think there's an empowerment there as well that you're not waiting for some magical uh, genie like PG and E to make sure the lights work for you. And so those dynamics I think are gonna play out in Alaska but also in these developing countries in ways that are hard to predict but I think are really exciting. I think there's a lot of opportunities there. You know, you mentioned that different places need different kinds of wind turbines. And that, that makes me wonder, you know, I've always thought of wind energy as like we just need a better turbine then it's all gonna be great. But like how many do we need? Do we need a, a different turbine for every environment? In which case that's a, a lot of research money spread I like, I like where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> Should we, we could give it all to you? <laughs> no, the, the short answer is that the challenge in, in extracting the energy from the wind is that you have a resource that, it, again, if you're in Iowa or somewhere like that, is in a single direction and usually at a single speed for a long period of time. And the systems that you see out in the plains today were optimized for that condition. And so the challenge is if I talk about the wind energy in San Francisco, or LA, or any of the mega cities that, that Ian talked about, it's a much more complex complicated wind field. And so we don't yet know today, this is a basic research question, what's the optimal device that you would stick in that location to convert that energy into some usable form? What we do right now is say, well, we know the three-bladed system works in the smooth uh, wind system or in the laminar flow as we would call it mostly laminar, and let's just shrink it down and stick it in that environment. And that doesn't work. The other turbine technology that we work with, it's uh, blades that rotate around a, a vertical axis. So they'll call that a vertical axis wind turbine as opposed to horizontal axis. It'll do a little bit better in those complicated wind fields because it doesn't need to be pointed in a prevailing wind direction. But I can tell you after seven years in the field, uh, they break down all the time. So I, I used to have a full head of hair. I pulled it all out. <laughs> all of the failures. And so, so this is basic research. And again, it's not something that uh, the private sector is ready to jump in and spend the money to test turbines and see them fail over and over again. And so uh, that's a, a gap that I think uh, limits the speed with which some of these technologies can achieve transformation. Where we have had success in PV, for example, and you have a government like China who's willing to put in a lot of money into manufacturing it at a very large scale, that's where you see the benefits uh, of these technologies. But uh, that step comes after the basic research, and so I think it's important we not lose sight of supporting those efforts. Yeah. Um, I want to ask one more question, then we can turn to the audience. And this is a um, th this is just a curiosity on my part, and that is in your you you look at um, inequality and violence, which are clearly important and interesting. Um, but why those two? Are those is that an anthropology thing? Is that like kind of what you look at when you say you're looking at society's values, or did you pick those two for some other reason? Or it just seems like we have a lot of values and yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that, that's that's part of the problem. We we have a lot of values, and so uh, if I was going to try to write a book about a lot of values, well, it would be really boring, and really long, and no one would buy it. Um, so I, uh, I I started what seemed to me a, a core question is this sense of fairness. I mean, I think about you. Know, what what are core human values that people all over the world share, and can they be boiled down to just one or two things? And it seemed to me that fairness and just rightness was the, the heart of this particular value question they'd asked me to talk about. Um, the violence thing, uh, it's absolutely shameless of me, but I had just written a book about the history of war. <laughs> and so I felt like I, I just know a lot about this. And, um, and it also, I felt like it was something I couldn't easily get away from in when I started thinking about the values issues. Uh, because um, Use of violence is one of the things that I think just strikes to the heart of rightness and, and justice. And it seemed to me that I mean, it's almost impossible to find a society where you can show that people really thought violence was good. Um, and you know, even ones where I say you know, ex you know, extremely militaristic societies like Nazi Germany, um, there's 
very little evidence um, from the psychologists that uh, the psychologists were able to collect that people had deeply internalized the idea that violence against um, you know, another ethnic group or uh, violence to oppose our will on the world is really a good thing. Um, see, what, what you actually see is uh, that it seems to me, again, that almost all of us, I mean, I assume most of us probably think we're pacifists and not violent people, uh, but almost all of us, there are things we would fight for. And so if somebody breaks into your house in the middle of the night, waving a big axe in the air, and is planning to chop your family up into small pieces, if you need to act violently to protect them, I think almost all of us will do that. Um, yeah, almost all of us have something we are prepared to fight for and die for or kill for. But in different historical contexts, the, the kind of the, the 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 circle of things for which that is considered to be okay is wider or small, larger or smaller. And so, in our own society, particularly in the, the richest parts of Western societies, the sort of circle of things for which we will tend to say, yeah, you know, Amy was right to smash that guy's head in. <laughs> it's pretty damn small. Um, you know, parking space, no. Um, <laughs> killing your family, yeah, maybe. Pay raise, no. You know, it's pretty, pretty damn small. Um, in farming societies, pre-modern farming societies, the circle is a lot bigger. Your honor. I mean, this is something, just pick up you know, Shakespeare or something. If a guy stands up and stabs another guy because he just insulted the first guy's father, everybody says, yeah, go. That's the thing to do. That is what you should be doing. If we, again, we tend to say not. Um, in um, hunter-gatherer societies, the circle tends to be wider still. Um, and I think it is, it is largely driven by the development of the institutions. Do we have other ways to resolve these problems? Now we have lots and lots of ways. If, if, we, get, if we start fighting, the police are going to come. You know, it's all going to be We have moderators. Up. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, sometimes it breaks down and United Airlines drags the people <laughs> off the plane. But it doesn't always work out. But basically, this is, this is what I think has changed. And this, I think, is very tightly linked to this issue of fairness and values and your, your sense of justice. And you know, we tend to think very few, there's very few situations which is just to be violent. Most societies in history felt very differently about this. It's also, I noticed, sort of convenient that those were two, two things you could look at, but that also you could, you could um, put some numbers on it. Yes. You've got yes. some nice little graphs yes. in the book. And, I love you my know, graphs. So you could, you could actually <laughs> quantify those, whereas I guess a lot of values might have been harder to quantify, especially looking back at a forager yeah. society that we just yeah. don't know much about. Yeah, there's this great thing, um, which again, I'm sure some of you have come across, the World Values Survey which a group of sociologists in Europe started doing in 1981, where they, they figured out this, um, uh, I mean, it's a little bit strange, but it's actually a very clever way of quantifying values in different countries. And so when I started this work on, on values, I was thinking about, well, to what extent are they related to, to energy capture, which is my, my basic shtick. The, the first place to go was, of course, the World Values Survey, because they are looking at these different countries. You can quantify pretty precisely now levels of energy being extracted, different economic bases in different countries. How well does that map onto um, attitudes toward, you know, ideas of uh, what, what, say, uh, gender fairness and justice is like, um, income fairness and justice, or use of violence? And you can look at all these things, and, and by and large, it does actually work out quite nicely for my, my theory, which is probably why I like the World Value <laughs> Survey so much. But it only goes back to 1981. And then you are forced to fall back on the more conventional methods of the humanist and social scientists for data gathering. Um, but I think quantifying it whenever possible is the only way to go. And this is one of the many reasons that most of my colleagues in the humanities dislike me so much. But this is, I think, the only way you can try to answer these sorts of questions. Yeah. Um, OK, it's time for me to turn it over to questions from the oh. audience. So I'm told that there's a microphone that will be going around. And because this is being recorded and um, streamed live and all that, um, if people could hold their questions for the microphone, that would be helpful so that people listening in can hear. So um, do we have some questions? Uh, we have, I'm going to take the one in blue here. Hi, uh, great talk, thank you. Uh, how do you look at the change in human development and human history when we look at sort of the democratization of technology and open source and crowdsource and things like this? This is a whole different animal that's not been had in history in the past. So does this change sort of the basic human nature that I would look to Warren Buffett for when people are fearful, he's greedy, and when people are 
greedy, he's, he's fearful. And how does that change the J.R. Ewing philosophy of power is never given, it's only taken, and uh, even Scott McNeely's, uh, the advancement of technology is, is, is how fast you can di divest the existing infrastructure. So you've got these existing <clears throat> power structures, and is this new grassroots movement, if you will, and, and the technology and the ubiquity of information and tools going to be a radical change for energy in the future? I'm looking to you, John. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, uh, great question. Great, uh, great, great quotations as well. I, I, I would say um, yes and no, which I find is often a very, <laughs> very good answer. To these sorts All of right, things. next. So, um, but I think yes, you're absolutely right that the networking of the world, this is something that in many ways is very, very new and kind of does change everything. And particularly our ability now with um, you know, digital technologies that allow us to communicate almost instantaneously over vast dif distances. You know, th this is magic. Um, so much of what we do with our iPhones is magic. So in that way, yes. In another way, no. <laughs> I guess because uh, I think in sort of in terms of principles, this is just more of what we've already seen. Um, in that, say, you know, historians will often point to the invention of the printing press in the 15th century in Europe as being something very, very similar. We are, of course, massively slower and less efficient than what we're doing now. But it's the same basic idea of allowing ideas to spread enormously compared to what was possible before, very, very cheaply, very, very rapidly. Um, and many would say the invention of writing happened multiple times around the world in the last 5,000 years. That's something a bit similar. It allows you to store information, transfer it to other people. And I think you can actually go a lot further than that still and say this is part of the same story that the biological evolutionists look at going all the way back to the evolution of sexual reproduction. Um, when everything that lived reproduced by cloning, that is not a very good way of kind of mixing it up and introducing new, I mean, not ideas, but you know what I mean, new, new mutations into the mix. As soon as you start getting um, organisms that reproduce sexually, you hugely increase the amount of experimentation that's going on. So you know, in a way, I would say it's a, this is just another bit of a story that's been going on for billions of years. Um, but then, of course, as with every single example of the story, every time is different from all the others. And this one, and I think it is fair to say this one is like really, really different from the others. Uh, let's take one over here, and then our microphone will make its way over to this side. Um. You mentioned a couple of times nuclear weapons and how we don't get a and how we don't get second chances because of the invention of those weapons. Uh, given two things, firstly the internet and the crazy means of communication that we have available to us today, and number two the fact that the world is more commercially interconnected than ever. Do you really think there is a chance for another great war? I know we went, we might have skirmishes like Syria or whatever, but I personally believe that there is not. Well, I hope you're right. Uh, <laughs> I just fish out my crystal ball here. Uh, no, this is uh, something, I mean, the, the que uh, questions, this issue comes up a lot, of course, in discussions. And um, the I, thing that I think is really interesting here is if you want to find really positive, optimistic statements of how the world is now so commercially interconnected that great power war has become impossible, the best place to look is in European writings between 1910 and 1914, where um, Norman Angle won the Nobel Peace Prize for saying that um, major war was now impossible because all the economies are so interlinked. Um, and he, he said, you know, quite rightly, that through much of history, war has been one of the major processes for enrichment and wealth creation as well as wealth gathering. And now it isn't. A war is bound to uh, ravage the economies of everybody involved. So it can't happen. And he was absolutely right, except for that last crucial bit, it can't happen. It can happen. Um, and I mean, you know, people were not thinking about economic interlinking during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, I uh, would be delighted if what you said is true. I mean, obviously everybody would be delighted if what you said is true. But um, no, I don't agree, no. Um, sorry, quick follow-up. Don't you think the existence of nuclear weapons and mutually assured destruction would in itself be a good enough deterrent for a great war, if not the commercial interlinking of societies? 
Right. I've, I've got a head shaking over here. <laughs> <I've got> a <laughs> I'm just pessimistic. I mean, I think the mutual assured destruction, again, it's the rational thing, right? That's the rational thing that should keep people from uh, calamity. But we're not rational actors, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the great things for universities with the advent of nuclear weapons, and you know, everything is about <laughs> what does this do for me here at Stanford? One of the great things about nuclear weapons at universities is all the money government started spending to support research and rational choice theory, game theory, which is a boon for the social sciences. Um, and uh, people of the Rand Corporation in particular showed beyond any doubt that rational actors would not um, engage in nuclear war, and were even able to suggest strategies that governments could follow to make it more likely that we stayed on the equilibrium path in these games and didn't blow each other up. But what everybody realized very quickly was that the game, these are iterated games on the assumption you play the game over and over again mm -hmm. and um, we learn to play the game properly and come up with a Nash equilibria where everybody wins and we don't all die. But the real world, we only do it once. I think that is the... The great problem. And of course, as I'm sure you're aware, there are a lot of people who say that far from making us less likely to blow each other to pieces, um, the sort of computerization of everything makes us more likely because it just gives us so many new ways to do it. You can tweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a guy over here in the blue shirt. Let's get him. Hi, so my question is, in layman's terms, wind seems to behave a lot like water and then it flows and it's directional. But if I put my wind turbine in front of yours, I get the energy and you don't. So historically, water rights has been a big issue over the centuries. A lot of conflicts and violence have broken out as a result. Is there a wave of wind rights that we should be concerned about? That's a great question. Oh. So in, in terms of the physics, one thing that we have at our advantage in the case of a wind farm is that there's space above us. And so in fact, the wind that you would feel blowing in your face is going to power maybe the first couple of rows of wind turbines. But the rest of the wind farm actually gets its energy because of turbulence that pulls in energy from above the farm. And so because there's a good kilometer at least of, of useful wind above you, it doesn't uh, run the same challenges that you do have if you're running tidal turbines. Now, that is another area of, of active research. So the, the village I mentioned in Alaska sits right next to a river where salmon run through. And so this becomes a big challenge. Do we allow the salmon to go through? That's a huge uh, uh, industry for that uh, part of the world. Or do we generate electricity from the water that's flowing? You end up having these conflicts that can arise because of the dual use that could occur in those situations. So I would say mainly it'll, we'll see that in the context of uh, hydrokinetic energy, as we call it, energy from water flows, the literal example that you use, less so from the wind energy example. The one maybe out there uh, exception would be if we installed so many wind farms in a particular location that it started to alter the local microclimate or local uh, uh, wind patterns. But we would, you know, I would say that's a good problem to have. That would mean our penetration of wind energy is at, you know, 30, 40 percent or something like that. Um, there's a guy right next to you there, Martha. Uh, hi. Um, touching on your point of fairness, I think one of the hard problems about energy today is that solutions seem to be unfair to someone. So the developing world says, well, the U.S., okay, you consume a lot of energy per capita. That gives you high quality of life. We want to consume a lot of energy per capita. Then the U.S. says, no, you can't do that with the fossil fuel that's cheaply available. But if they do do that, then what happens is, um, you know, the oceans rise and that destroys poor countries like you know, India and Bangladesh, so there's a fairness problem here. So how, how do we deal with that? How do we overcome this and get to a fair energy solution? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, actually, I mean, one of the things John has, seems uh, f to have been talking about is this idea that perhaps in uh, renewable systems, particularly wind systems, we're going to see more of a sort of democratization of, of energy. The, won't all be in the hands of, you won't have to have giant corporations that can raise the capital necessary to drill the oil wells or whatever. I mean, do you think that's likely to 
I think that, that's a good example of a way in which, and there was the earlier question about open sourcing, uh, the, the democratization of energy that isn't possible with fossil fuels, mm -hmm. that is possible with solar and wind and other renewables. Now, the, again, as I mentioned earlier, the irony right now is that we're not really taking advantage of it in the way that we, we could, certainly not in wind. We're doing better in the case of uh, solar, but residential PV also has other challenges. Uh, just plugging it into our existing system in the United States, for example, the, the regulatory and legal issues associated with that. But in, in the context of a, of a country like India or, or, or Bangladesh, I think there is an opportunity to uh, install a distributed energy that gives the people a sense of ownership there. And so uh, the question still is going to come, how much does it cost? So it's great. I'm a, you know, it's the, the Bernie Sanders comment about access to affordable health care versus actually being able to pay for it. Uh, in this case, we have to make these systems less expensive so that they don't have the option or they don't need to weigh, do I not eat and generate clean energy or do I burn diesel fuel and have the resources I need for my family? That's the position we're putting a lot of folks in right now because the renewable energy technologies are not cost effective enough yet. Um, let's come down here and take a question over there. Thank you. My question, maybe for both of you, but probably mostly for Ian. In your studies, and I, this reveals I didn't read any of your books, but uh, did you also study how people use this energy over time and sort of categorize it and make a hierarchy out of it? And sort of obviously, does it match Maslow or whomever is the current thinker in needs? Um, and then, of course, if you know all that or could know all that, can we start doing some predicting about where it goes in the future and how much energy we might need or want or in the future? Yeah, well, maybe, I mean, maybe John has, has thoughts about this too. But I mean, for my, my 10 cents for what it's worth is that I think the one thing that you, you do see throughout history is however much energy we have, we want more. And this has <laughs> always been the way. I think one, again, actually, this is something John would know more about, but I think one of the big debates at the moment uh, uh, among the people who try to predict where things might be going is um, what, what is going to happen uh, with a, an energy revolution, depending on what kind of form it takes. Because like, one of the big theories is that the way forward uh, to avoid you know, poisoning the atmosphere and everything, the, the way forward is to reduce our demands, so to live more simply and to consume less energy, which is something we've never been very good at in the past. But this is one of the theories. But uh, there's another one that um, people usually call it the Jevons paradox. That's this 19th century British economist who wrote this book about Britain and coal back in 1860. And Jevons said, look, there's this weird thing that's happened since 1760, the last hundred years, um, that the uh, amount of energy we're able to extract from a given volume of coal has increased roughly tenfold. Isn't that amazing? So wouldn't you expect that the amount of coal we burn will have fallen tenfold? And yet it hasn't. That's increased tenfold as well. And, and so the, the second theory says that, like, like with the Industrial Revolution, we don't know what we're going to do if um, if John is able to deliver almost unlimited amounts of clean energy at almost zero cost, sure. which is uh, what I am confident, <laughs> confident he is going to do for me, uh, we, we don't know what we're going to do with it. Just like people in the late 18th century you know, couldn't possibly foresee um, what people were going to do in the 19th century with all this energy. Um, the world is going to become a wildly different place you know, if we are able to generate energy on this scale uh, at sort of low levels of cost that some people are talking about. Yeah. And I guess one of my questions for John is, are they? Are, are we? Is this what's going to happen? Well, I, you know, it's, it's hard to predict the future, uh, but I think the, the revolution that would surprise us but also be even more impactful than really cheap uh, wind energy or solar energy is on the energy efficiency side, a techno technological revolution that makes our use of energy much more efficient. And it's not a sexy topic, so it, it's more about you know uh, losing weight as opposed to a fancy new belt to hold the, you know, the bigger pants up. And, <laughs> and so I think the question is, how do we motivate people to think about the energy consumption side, as you, you pointed out in your opening 
interesting remarks. In the United States, we are much more energy inefficient than they are European counterparts, who you can say have a similar quality of life and still are able to be much more efficient. I heard earlier the moderator has a Chevy Bolt. So, uh, you know, there are technologies available that allow us to reduce our consumption, but it takes time for these things to permeate uh, society. I think that would be a much more effective. Uh, energy transformation, in my opinion, than even the things that I work on in wind energy. That's trying to keep up with an ever-growing demand. And if you look at the population explosions, the gentleman earlier uh, talked about the developing world, not only are they numerically growing in number, but as you might expect, they want a higher quality of life, and so they're going to be consuming more energy. And so the question becomes, how do we keep up with all of that demand while you know, helping all of you, you know, charge your iPhones on a daily basis? It's a huge problem, and I don't think we're just going to get there with a less expensive solar panel or a wind turbine. We're going to need to think about energy efficiency alongside it. But it, for one reason, or, like, I guess it's for obvious reasons, it's just not really a, a sexy topic. Let's take a question on this side. Um, let's come down here. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I was going to get this. <laughs> <laughs> I might regret it now. So, um, the energy revolutions we've been talking about have been, you know, pretty large scale, right? Like uh, you said, going from like 5,000 calories a day to like 30,000. I'm wondering if you think things like solar and wind energy are enough to get us to like an order of magnitude change in energy consumption. To me, it seems like they're more kind of incremental in terms of like how much more energy we can capture. So numerically, certainly you have enough headroom. The, the current consumption around the world is order 15 to 18 trillion watts of, of power. Uh, wind energy, the total resource at any given time is around 200 uh, trillion watts solar energy even higher. And so, uh, you know, you can't do two orders of magnitude, but you could, you could get to one that you're using all your wind energy at that point, which leads to other issues that we talked about earlier. So again, that, that goes back to my comment about energy efficiency. I, I, at some point, we do plateau one way or another. Now, I say that knowing that if you, you read the early history of the 20th century, the concern was running out of food, and we find more efficient ways to, to, to harvest uh, uh, food. And so I think we can potentially see more efficient ways to consume energy that allow us, without having to increase by an order of magnitude our wind and solar above uh, the resource that ceiling that we have, to still have them be 50, 60, 70 percent of our electricity generation at the least. The other aspect that is related to, you know, we've been talking a lot about electricity, but solar fuels, using the sun to generate fuels for transportation and other sectors for the chemical uh, chemicals industry, those are also technologies that could do uh, a significant uh, displacement of uh, current fossil fuel use that would be important. So I don't think we have to worry about running out of sun or wind anytime soon. Okay, let's take one from the middle here. There's a woman in a blue sweater. Yeah, you. And then I think this might be the last question. It's Am I supposed to wrap it up? At, yeah, I'm getting a nod. Yeah, all right. Um, there's, I, I guess, some refreshments um, out in the courtyard, and our speakers will be around um, so they can keep talking out there. So please go ahead. Um, we've had six months to get adjusted to a new administration here in the United States, and you touched a little bit on um, topics of private sector funding for energy research. So as it seems apparent, with six months of hindsight, that the US government is not going to continue to fund energy research, are you truly seeing that the private sector is, is stepping up and stepping in and, and funding what we as a society need to keep going? Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, throw my hands up. I did on November 8th, but I won't today. Uh, <laughs> I think that there are some, some strong cases to be made in the area of energy security, for example. Having these sources that are more distributed, like wind and solar, does provide us with a more resilient energy uh, supply in the United States than our conventional fossil-based system. The innovation that comes with these new technologies uh, brings jobs, employment. I'm from uh, Toledo, Ohio, where a lot of the plants that were up and running when I grew up as a kid are no longer there. And they're looking for new industries to retool and be able to manufacture. And you can imagine that being solar panels, wind turbines, uh, uh, batteries, other uh, technologies in this renewable revolution. So there are arguments to be made, aside from climate change, for 
this energy transformation that we've been talking about. I think the challenge is, and this is a, a sort of philosophical question, at what point do we start making those arguments as the first argument as opposed to climate change? Because with, with many of our colleagues, my, my good people in Ohio, if you start with climate change, that's you, you've lost the, the discussion right away. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm sort of swallowing my pride and, you know, what I think is correct and saying, okay, fine, we're not going to talk about renewable energy on that basis, but let's talk about the resilience of our grid to a terrorist attack. Let's talk about the jobs that Toledo and Cleveland and Columbus could potentially have if we do this here. As Ian said earlier, there's no guarantee. We don't have an inalienable right to innovation in the United States. If we don't do it here, China will do it, India will do it, Korea will do it. And so we have to decide whether we're going to take hold of this opportunity or not. But, but it's, a, it's an economic opportunity. And at the end of the day, I think, you know, there's, they talk about red and, and blue states. Uh, at the end of the day, business. The green uh, is, is what motivates people. And so if they can make money off of it, I, I think we'll see more of it. Uh, to answer your question more directly, no, I don't think that private industry has the deep enough pockets to, to replace the, 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 the government funding, frankly. I wanted to follow up quickly on that. Yeah. I get the last word. Please. <laughs> um, Rob Jackson, who's a um, sure. very well-regarded environmental scientist at Stanford, recently published a sort of impassioned plea in Scientific American. I think it's in this month's Scientific American called Let's Not Talk About Climate Change. So yeah. he makes that argument and has some really great examples of the way we should be talking about the energy transformation um, without talking about climate change. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting read if, if people are interested. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>